and welcome to Catacrisp Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.catacrisp.com. My name is Jason J. Rock Houston. Today we're speaking with my good friend Rick Fox, and this is part two of a Rick Fox story. Now, last time I talked to you, Rick, we talked a lot about um, the Steeler album and your days in Steeler. And so um, we're picking up um, part two of this with um, kind of a, when you leave Steeler. And I was reading um, on the Wikipedia at that time, at that point in time that you know you had after the success of Steeler, you had this um, real bankable name that they thought that um, this guy can um, you know form a band and kind of um, let's see what he can do on the LA club scene. So let's pick it pick it up from there. How did the band um, Sin come together? Well, uh, Sin originally started back in Jersey in the, in, uh, in the 70s. Okay. It was, uh, uh, you know, we were playing the Jersey club scene. And, um, you know, we, we were doing the whole British invasion glam thing. Uh, you know, I, I was... Uh, Martian Rock Band had folded. So uh, I was working in a, in a clothing store in, in the village in Manhattan, right, right a couple of doors down from Electric Lady Studios. And uh, this guitar player walks in with his wife or his girlfriend, and, and you know, he, he liked my look, and, yeah. and uh, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm a bass player. He goes, oh, I think we're looking for a bass player. And I said, what's the name of your band? And he said, Virgin. Okay. And, uh, you know, they were playing the Jersey Shore and you know, like that and whatnot, and, and um, I saw a picture of him in, in uh, Roxine Magazine, you know, taken on the boardwalk down there in, in Jersey. And uh, I guess I could see why they asked me to replace their bass player. Uh, I didn't know the guy, yeah. but, uh, but uh, I guess I must have had a better look or something. I don't know. So uh, so uh, we arranged to have a, a, an audition in and, and, and one of the studios in Manhattan. And uh, that's where I met Ian Chris, who was, who was the singer. And and uh, he's uh, really good friends with David Coverdale these, these days. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, He's got a band called uh, Rock Candy. Okay. Uh, and they play they play the you know the tri-state area all the time, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and all that. Very very a a active band. But anyway, so uh, they were called Virgin, and, and I auditioned, and I was kind of okay. I, I, I didn't know a lot of the songs, but uh, Ian wanted me in the band, so he told the guitar player to work with me and and show me what I need to know. And I came in and I started rehearsing with the band, uh, you know, in Jersey, in a garage, and uh, with a PA. Wow. And like that, you know, you know, and and uh, so I was I was rehearsing with them for a while, and we went out and did some gigs, and uh, you know, we were in like like eight inch platforms. We had a a, a, a bow, a, a python, snake. Uh, wow. The Alice Cooper. We, we were doing an Alice Cooper show, and. And Mata Hoople and, and uh, Aerosmith and, and you know like that all, all kinds of you know whatever the whatever was was the heavy rock but yeah. glam stuff at the time and then uh, uh, the drummer left so we had we got another drummer I, I brought my friend uh, Basil in Bas Basil Stanley and then uh, he came in and we changed it to Lust for like two or three weeks four weeks and then from that is when I came up with the name Sin okay and drew it up drew it up with the logo with the snake i and like that and uh and we were playing you know the, the jersey circuit for you know a few years and then ian got an offer to go uh play drums with another uh, cover band uh, tribute whatever you know a uh, club band so sin kind of dissolved at that point and that's and the name kind of went on the back burner jump ahead now to la and uh, after steeler I didn't want to let any uh, any moss grow. Yeah. I wanted to, you know, keep the momentum going um, like that, and get before any you know dead zone between bands kind of stuff. I happened to have gotten introduced to a keyboard player who was playing in Arizona, then in Vince Gilbert, and he kind of had that that Greg Jafria look. I mean, the same haircut, blonde wow. with the layers and all like that. Yeah. And he had a, a similar setup with the old traditional Hammond B three and, and you know synthesizers and all of that. A lot of a lot of heavy gear. Wow. But, you know, he was a fan of John Lord, and I liked Deep Purple, and, and I was also a big fan, of, especially a big fan of Uriah Heep, and he liked Uriah Heep. So uh, we kind of got on well like that. And then uh, I still had, I, I, I have to kick myself because uh, I, I wasn't really good at screening people yet. Okay. I, I, was, I was still new in L.A., and I didn't know who was who, and I was trying to trust my instincts, and, and uh, you know, uh, right, right around this time, I was I was getting uh, hit on by 
guitar players who were like Ingve fans. Wow. And the thing is, I wanted to get away from the Ingve style playing. I don't want to be known for, for you know, kind of tough for that. I mean, I got known for it, but yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, uh, I got I got called up by. Um, a really great guitar player, nice kid, uh, Chris Impelitari. Oh wow, yeah, fantastic yeah. guitar player, really, really nice guy. We got on well, we jammed a little bit, you know. And, and he was, you know, uh, guys who, who who admired Malmsteen wanted to play with me because I played with Malmsteen. So I hear it was you. Kind of like, you know, the same way Malmsteen played with Graham Bonnet because Graham Bonnet was in Deep Purple or, or Rainbow. Yeah, whatever. yeah. So there was an affiliation thing there, Six Degrees, whatever. So. You know, I, I, I'm saying I, I, we, we jammed, but nothing really came out of it, and and we just agreed to, to go our ways and like that. And now let me like, ask you, Rick, before we go on with the story. Um, now, of course, um, Chris and Patel, if, you, if you're much into that type of um, guitar playing music, um, he, he's had he's had you know quite a bit of success. Nowhere say as an Inkley Malmsteen, but it, anybody that um, follows these type of guitar players knows knows who Chris is. Um, were you at all surprised to see kind of um, what he would go on to become? Well, I knew he was going to go on and be something. He was a fantastic guitar yeah, player. Yeah. But he was in the same vein as Momstein. You know, it was like a million notes up and down the neck. Yeah. And I wanted to go, I wanted to revert more to something closer to the 70s. I hear you, yeah. See, you, know, you, you kind meant, of trying to build your own thing, you know, kind of, um, this is what I'm doing now. And, and that was the era that, that I, I really enjoyed was, you know, bands out of the 70s. Yeah, now let me ask you, Rick, because, you know, um, I'm a huge Alice Cooper fan myself. You mentioned that you know, the previous band you were kind of covering all this great glam rock that was out at the time, and um, I, rec I recently did this um, show on the fact that um, t um, this year marks the 50th anniversary, if you can believe it, of Alice Cooper's "Love It to Death" album. And what's interesting about that, you know, not only has he been in the business so long, but um, I had a chance to go back and kind of listen to the first two Alice Cooper albums, and it's kind of amazing because. Um, on that Love It to Death album, I think Alice Cooper finally found his sound. That's the first album they did with, you know, Bob Ezrin. And, and what's amazing, if you listen to like, um, the very first Al two Alice Cooper albums, they almost sound psychedelic. But um, I I'm just bringing this up because, like, I'm a huge Alice fan, and it's just a it's amazing that he's been around that long. Well, uh, uh, Love It to Death wasn't his first album. No, no, it's, but, like, I, it's kind of his breakout album is what I'm saying. And if you go, and, and I went and kind of listened to, like, Pretties for You, which came before that, and right. it, it sounds totally different, but um, it, it's amazing, you know, that it, it Alice is still doing what he does. Well, they were still looking for who they were. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they, didn't, they didn't have a polished sound then until they hooked up with Bob Ezrin. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. On that album, like, you can hear Alice Cooper, like, they found their sound. That's exactly what I was telling somebody. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, they played at Max's Kansas City. I think that's where they got signed. Uh, same place I played. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, they... Frank Zappa saw them and liked them. Uh, uh, they, they managed. They, they wound up being managed with Shep Gordon. Yeah. And it, Shep is the one that got them. I guess uh, uh, with with Bob Ezrin, if I can remember. And then Bob helped really polish their sound. And it was like a night and day difference in, in, from like the second album to, to Love It to Death. Oh, that's what I'm saying. If people like you, you think you know what Alice Cooper's about. You go listen to some like Pretties for You, and and it, it, it's all right stuff, but it's like almost psychedelic kind of music, and it, it's very different. But you know that that's the band kind of finding their roots well that, that second album yeah uh that one of the songs from the second album was was in the soundtrack for a film called diary of a mad housewife okay and and they recreated the scene on stage where they're playing at a, at a what they call the loft party you know they had loft parties in in, in uh, new york and stuff like that and uh they recreated the whole chicken scene on stage where they're throwing chickens around and oh, yeah, that's uh, where that... pillowcases full of feathers and stuff like that. And You know, uh, it was that really avant-garde slash psychedelic stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but, but uh, uh, it was easy action. I think that was the album. Oh, but, there you yeah, go. But, when, when they, when they became, you know, and they also did a tribute to uh, West Side Story, you know, because uh, they, they did a, a, before the Gutter Cats and Jets, they were still doing that, that a little bit of, a nod towards West Side Story. Oh, wow. Okay, that, that uh, explains and, that. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and then they reprised it back again, you know, on, on Gutter Cat versus the Jets later on. But, uh, yeah, yeah, Love It to Death, was that was a game changer for me. Yeah. That oh, was yeah. a total game changer for I me. I bet, yeah. And, yeah, and, and then when I joined the fan club, I still have my all my membership stuff. <laughs> and then uh, 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 when Killer came out, mm -hmm. that was just like, 
double game changer. Yeah, yeah, that's like 50th anniversary of that album too. And, and you know, it, it's amazing because um, I, I've heard, like even the guys in KISS talk about Paul Stanley. I heard it once in an interview saying, you know, um, when KISS was first getting together, he says all four of them like went to an Alice Cooper show together and, and Paul's the one that kind of had the idea. Okay, that that band is great, but, but, but they just have one guy in the band kind of getting made up. We're going to have all four guys get made up. You know, they, KISS kind of um, saw what Alice was doing and then they, they took it to the next level. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So getting back to sin, because um, um, right. wow. Are so you... anyway, like I hook up with with uh, with Vince Gilbert, and we're you know now we have to. He's a keyboard player, and, yeah. and now I have to uh, find the rest of the members. And I had I had remembered the drummer Carl uh, Carl James from when I auditioned for the Greg Leon Invasion. Oh wow, Greg Leon. Yeah, yeah, and and Greg Greg Leon was one of the loudest guitar players in L.A. I mean, like total Marshall Stacks, you know. And and, uh, and I'm sure just to let the people listen to this know, Rick, um, yeah, Greg Greg Leon, he's one of the first guys I ever interviewed when I first started doing this. But um, I bring him up because um, as I'm sure you know, he was a kind of key player too back in the days in um, the L.A. scene. I mean, um, he played in like. Um, an early version of um, Quiet Right, which was, they went by the name Dubro at the time, and then he also right. played in Dawkins, and then, you know, of course, he's got the Greg Leon invasion, he's been doing all these these years, so um, it's amazing, you, you're coming you're coming in contact with all these kind of um, guys that would kind of, um, like Greg Leon, I, I put him right up there with you, because too, um, he's one of those guys that he's kind of, um, you know, um, he, kind of a, a figure that's been on the scene for years, and people know him you know like they know the fact that okay he's been in quiet right and docking and all this but um he still you know never really got his big break if you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. uh he's a really nice guy i enjoyed getting along you know with him but uh, i for some reason i i guess i didn't have what it took to yeah. to uh, be in his band so but i remember the drummer and and uh, you know carl had kind of a uh, a, a, a bend towards the Cozy Powell School, which oh, I, wow. was my, my favorite drummer. Yeah. So uh, I contacted him. We got him in. Uh, as as uh, Greg said later, oh, you took him off my hands. Thanks. <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, I, fr I really don't remember where we got art from, the singer. Okay. Uh, because he was somebody I guess I was just introduced to. And uh, of all things, uh, here I, the, uh, the irony of, as I said, I wanted to get away from the Ingve style guitar players. And I got rec uh, Howard Drossen got introduced to me, recommended uh, through a friend, a mutual friend. And he said, you know, uh, uh, he's a real, he's a, a classical type player, but he's, he's really good when he's loud like that. And, <laughs> okay. And he's, he's really, he was really young. He was like yeah. 18, 19, just like Malmsteen. And it turns out <laughs> that Howard was a Malmsteen fan. So it's like, oh my God, you play with Malmsteen? I want to play with you in a band. Wow. So, <laughs> I wound up going right back to the thing I was trying to get away from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's funny. And we really didn't have, you know, there was no, it, it was harder back then to try and find guys. Either you had to go to shows and, and look at other guys or, or, you know, look at the classified ads, things like that. You know, there was no internet. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I just, we took a chance. I threw it in there. Uh, because of course, it was a, a referral of a friend. And, um, you know, he, uh, Howard did some growing. While he was in the band, he stretched and he grew a little bit, you know, looking yeah. for himself, and he found it, which was good. But uh, so we, we got the we got the all five of us together, and we started rehearsing. Uh, Vince kind of handled some of the rehearsal business stuff. We agreed that since the band was based around me and my 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 notoriety with with Steeler, you know, I was going to be the, the 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 guy walking point to open the doors and yeah. get us where we needed to go. So like that you know so uh, uh let's see and let me um, ask you like when, when you guys are just starting out um or, or like when you start gigging there are all the ads saying like um sin featuring x dealer basis rick fox and stuff like that well we didn't we didn't get to that yet okay we, we, were, we were still you know trying to we didn't know what we were going to call ourselves yeah you know and and um vince was got us rehearsing at carrie doll studio oh wow then in, in, in downey and Carrie was really nice, and so we're rehearsing, rehearsing there, and uh, and then we, we moved around to a couple other rehearsal places, and as it was coming together musically, I said, okay, so what are we going to call ourselves? And they're all looking around, going, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, there was there was no, I, I couldn't share, let's say, vision 
with with these guys. They they were just they were players. Yeah, they were yeah. players in other people's bands. They were never called upon to 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 uh, contribute anything in a, in a creative way like that. You know, that was they, they were just instrumental. Guys. They played their instrument, you know, and that was it. They were not never asked to come up with anything beyond that. So they were kind of stumped. Uh huh. And I said, "Look, what do we call it? Sin." And and they, right out of right out of the gate, no. I was met with resistance. No, no, no. That was a band you had years ago. But this is a new band. You know that that kind of ego thing starts to show its head. You know. Wow, wow. The the, the, the potential uh, territorial threat, I guess you might call it. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, "All right, look, I'm going to put a line in the sand." I said, "I'm going to give you guys two weeks, two to fourteen days, two weeks to come up with something." If you can't come up with a band name that describes who we are, then it's going to be sin. And that's it. I'm going to put my foot on it. And they kind of, oh, hem and haw, hem and haw. And, all right, all right, all right. I'm telling you, Jason, two yeah. weeks. Yeah. Came and went. No ideas. Nothing. No ideas. Nothing. Yeah. They had nothing hit the fan. Nothing. Now, so, now let me ask you, Rick, besides um, the fact that this had been the previous band's name and, and you thought it's a cool sounding name, um, was there any thought to like, you know, sin's kind of um, simple, it's kind of like one word name like kiss, it's easy for people to remember, um, any, any thought into that? Well, that's what I brought up, yeah, uh, yeah. I said it's, 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 you know, it's, it's easy to remember, yeah. like you said, like kiss, and, yeah. and, uh, and they're like, they've just, they were just hemming and hawing about it, and, and kind of resistant because it was used before, yeah. I said, yeah, but that was in Jersey, this is California, this is... A good chance, you know, to, to you know, they didn't, they didn't want anything from to the do previous yeah. to, to shadow over onto the. I said, how? How is that going to happen? Who's going to know you about know? it except maybe when my name's mentioned? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was it. It was sin, and that was it. Um, you know, and Vince said, yeah, you know, he's right. So mm -hmm. like that, and uh, so we uh, we, we uh, went to do some some shows to, to kind of loosen up to break it in. We had to go out of town. Okay. And we went to, to Vince had some connections in Arizona, and and we went to Phoenix, and it was it was a hell drive there and back. I mean, everything that could go wrong went wrong. You know, I I, I called it the Arizona boner tour. Okay. Because <laughs> everything was going wrong. Everything was going. It's a good thing we, we worked it out going out of town. Uh, but there was a whole series of of of. of uh, incidents that had happened that had kept throwing the hamstrings on us but we got through it we we played at uh, rockers in phoenix now oh, here's another example 30 seconds we're, we're on stage the intro tape is playing we're getting ready and and howard looks hits goes to hit his guitar and he goes he, he panics he goes my guitar it's not on it's not on like that you know okay. and, and i could see the shadow the cord swinging from his guitar strap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It said, "Try plugging it in, moron." Yeah. <laughs> wow. And he plugs. He goes, "Oh yeah, thanks." Plugs it in. <laughs> uh, 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 there's the guitar. Yeah. Wow. Like that. Anyway, so we we played rockers. There was nobody there? Okay. Because uh, nobody nobody knew us. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And we went to, we went to Flagstaff. Oh my God! It was it was like killer cold snow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're at a higher altitude, you know, and and we played at some place. The the stage was like behind the bar. So we had to go through the bar and, and get up onto this. And it was like an island, and, and the bar went around the island, and, and that was the stage up there. Oh wow, wow! Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I got sick. I had some kind of cold or a fever or something. I was just miserable. And see, Arizona is the type of place that, depending on what time of year you go, it's either really, really extremely hot, like hundred ten degree weather, or really, really cold. Because there are, like you said, some places in Arizona where it does snow. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, you know, Flagstaff was was uh, was uh, upper altitude, so yeah. You know, and we froze to death, but you know, we got through it. Yeah. So <laughs> we get we get back to L.A. and I, I contacted uh, the Troubadour, okay. and I said I'd like to bring my my new band in, and they said okay, and I'm on, I'm on the phone with them. They don't they don't know who that who I am for okay. some reason. I don't know. Yeah. So I said, you know, I have a new band. It's it's, it's, it's I said it's Rick Fox. I have a new band. It's called Sin, and and. We'd like to do a show there, and I said, "Okay, so uh, uh, Wednesday night, uh, eight o'clock. You know, like like all the other uh, the new bands. Yeah, you know, you got you got to start at the bottom." I said, "Wait a minute!" I said, "I just played there like a, a month ago." I said, "I sold out your club." <laughs> yeah. They said, "Wait a minute, who, who are you with?" I said, "Steeler." 
and there was like a pause, and, and she goes, okay, uh, Saturday night, 10 o'clock slot, who do you want to have open, who do you want to have closed? Just like that. <laughs> yeah, wow, wow. I said, because I, I said, I sold out your club. <laughs> what, what do you mean I got to start at the bottom? What what is that? You know, I gave them a little New York attitude. Yeah, yeah, wow. Well. You know, and 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 so I they we they gave us a uh, uh, bitch, you know, Betsy, Betsy yeah. bitch. Oh wow, yeah, Be- Betsy was. So yeah. we had bitch on the bill, and I, I can't remember who the other. Was. There was a couple of times we had bitch and witch, you know, opening and closing. Wow, wow. The middle. Uh, there was there was several other bands that played with us, but you know, we we started out, we we got a headline slot right right off the bat. Wow. It was he- I feel heavily advertised. Uh, we didn't have an image yet. We looked like the Brady Bunch in our first band picture in <laughs> Bam Magazine. Yeah. We looked really harmless. But then, you know, I started trying to design costumes uh, uh, based off of what I saw. Uh, uh, the, the, the band Police. Okay, yeah, yeah. Had, had a video on MTV called Synchronicity 2. I, yeah, I remember. Okay, yeah. Remember. And it starts out with, with, you know, Sting hanging from a, a wire. Oh, wow. And his clothes look like they've been apocalypse blasted <laughs> yeah yeah he had all these shreds of different colored fabric on his clothing i said this like like kiss looking at alice this one guy dressed yeah, like yeah, yeah. i said would it be great if you can get the whole band to look like that and everybody have different their own color wow you know yeah. so I, I started cutting up shredding fabric and, and shirts and all kinds of you know and i i was making costumes for for us and you know because nobody had any idea what they wanted to look like yeah you know, and like that. So uh, we did our first show at, at the Troubadour, and it was packed. It was absolutely packed. Uh, I'm told Motley Crue was there, uh, Rat was there. Somebody said Malmsteen was in the crowd. Uh, I don't know. Um, David Lee Roth was there. Wow. You know, so I don't know how that happened, but, you know, all these these big stars showed up to see me, see what I was had to offer. Now let me ask you, Rick, because I've seen things that you posted on your site where, um, you know, you you've known Nikki Six, I guess, for for a number of years now. Um, did you know him like um, during the Steeler days, or did you meet um, sometime after that? I actually met Nikki right out of when I was uh, uh, when I exited out of Wasp. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. In '82, um, I, I was living. I was doing a couch tour. I was living with a bunch of uh, girls in, in a in a apartment. They were sharing an apartment on Clark Street which is right up the block from the whiskey. Yeah. And Motley Crue lived in the apartment next to where these girls lived. Wow. <laughs> you see? Yeah. So uh, that's kind of where I met, I met Nikki there. And, and we got along, you know, really well. Uh, when I was in Steeler, we played the Roxy with uh, Vandenberg. Oh, wow. Adrian Vandenberg yeah. from Whitesnake, yeah. We did, it, we <laughs> did it, a du- double bill. It was two shows, an early show and a late show with Vandenberg. Wow. And uh, Nikki came, you know, he brought Blackie with him. But uh, he came to, to see us and, and came backstage and... He said, I just want to congratulate you. He goes, look, the three of us, they're all black-haired guys, <laughs> yeah, yeah. leather jackets, and we all play bass and like that. And, you know, and then, uh, so Dickie was being really cool to me and, and like that. He always was. And, yeah. You know, he gave, he'd given me uh, his red thigh-high boots. He used to give me his hand-me-down oh, wow. costuming. Cool. <laughs> uh, he, called, he called me up one day and he said, hey, listen, uh, uh, we got a new budget for the Shout Out to Devil uh, album tour. So I, I got some new gear coming. So go over to SIR Studios. I have your name already. I'm one of my amps. You can all got, you can just go have it mm. like that. So yeah. he used to give me his gear and his clothes, his stage clothes, things like that. So anyway, Nikki showed up, and I, you, I, you know, at the Steelers show. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, we when when uh, we'll, we'll get to where he comes in again. Like okay, that. that's fine. I was just asking. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. So so this is this was the this was sin. You know, we we were on uh, you know out the gate and and uh, r- the rubber hit the road and, and we're we're doing it. You know, we're doing shows, and uh, we got booked at uh, Perkins Palace. We played with Armored Saint. Oh, and, wow. and Malice, and uh, Vince got into a fight with the guys in Malice because a lot <laughs> of the a lot of the, the local bands would try to act like the touring acts. Wow. You know, and, yeah. and they, once they they set they set up their gear for sound check, they didn't want to move their gear. They said it stays. The next band puts their stuff in front, and so on. And by the time you know we got to sound check, there was almost no room on the stage. Wow! wow. You know, yeah. and, and we were supposed to, we were supposed to open. <laughs> yeah. And and Vince got into you know almost nose to nose with the guys in Malice, and you know I mean we're friends with them now, but but those guys were like fucking seven feet tall, you know. Yeah. The singer. <laughs> Wow. Anyway, so we what we did was we, we tried to turn lemons into lemonade, and we said, I'll tell you what, we'll go on after Armored Saint. 
we'll go on like clean up position. Okay. Like that. And this yeah. way this way we'll have the whole stage all to ourselves. Yeah. So so like that. And then and then, uh you know, I mean half the house left, but it was still pretty crowded. Yeah. You know, after after Armored Saint went off. Like that. And and you know, so we played Perkins Palace, we did did okay. Uh, we did a bunch of shows around, and, and uh, at some point during all of this, um, we had just gotten, Vince got us a, a, a deal with Azra Records, and we did a single, which was the song on, uh, that I wrote, On the Run, and that was our most popular song in the set, the, the fans loved it. So we did, a, we did a special collector's picture disc with the snake on it, which you can find from time to time on eBay or where somebody's somebody's got them. I don't know where they got them from, and they're selling them. Yeah, because they're collectors' items now, um, and and like that. So anyway, so we just we did a we did the the, uh, the picture disc single on the run. It was and the flip side was uh, captured in time, which really kind of showcased what we can do musically. We we came off sounding like a cross between Uriah Heep and Deep Purple in that. Wow. I mean, everybody shown in there. You know, the rhythm section was tight. Uh, me and Carl were, were like, you couldn't slip a piece of paper in between us. And I, and I got to say, like, you mentioned Deep Purple at the um, top of the interview, and I'm a huge Deep Purple fan like a lot of people, but um, one thing I always loved about Deep Purple, uh, you mentioned John Lord, the way they incorporated keyboards into the mu- music. I mean, oftentimes you'll hear people say, keyboards suck, they don't belong in rock music, but I, I that's exactly what I do. I point to John Lord and say, you... You put on any um, Deep Purple album with uh, John Lord, and then and then you say that, you know. Yeah. yeah. But then, then again, you've got uh, uh, conversely, and you're you right, Heap. Yeah. You have Ken Hensley. Yeah, he and, just and, recently passed. You know, yeah. Ken Ken could rock a, a, a B three just like just as good as John Lord. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and the critics the critics refer to Uriah Heap as the poor man's Deep Purple, but you know what? They were they were really. Uh, uh, they were they were underrated. They they should have been a lot bigger than they were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I dare say they're they're a little bigger in Europe, but you know that's obvious because that's where they're from. But um, that they're one of those was, bands that should have been much bigger. You're right. Yeah. I was a huge fan yeah. of your I Heap since like 1972. Yeah. I was in high school. Yeah, yeah. You know. So anyway, uh, I'm just eating a cracker here. That's all right. That's uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So you're talking about putting out the first picture disc, yeah. Yeah, like that. And then um, Vince brings this woman in who wants to manage the band. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know who she was. I never heard of her. I didn't know anything about a track record that I could find. And she puts a contract in front of us and says, I'm going to manage you guys, sign the contract. <laughs> wow. Let's, can we... I, this is this is where I start to become the boat rocker. Can we talk I'm about this? Loose, yeah. I'm, I'm the loose cannon. I'm, I'm the asshole. Yeah, yeah. Because I, because I said, well, I, let me take the, the contract to an attorney and let me have it looked over. And and she took that personal. Wow. You know, she got pissed off. Subsequently, the rest of the band got pissed off and they're all pissed off at me. I said, why? What's wrong with taking it to, to, to an attorney to have it looked over? That it's like, oh, don't you trust me? Kind of kind of an attitude thing, you know? Uh-huh. And it's like, she's going to do great with us. She's going to do great with us. I said, I don't even know what she's done for anyone else. Yeah, yeah. You know? So th- that kind of rubbed the band the wrong way. Well, wow. I mean... And then, uh, you know, during the writing process, I was finding myself more and more being kind of pushed out of the writing process of my with, own band. My own, yeah, my own yeah. band. You know, they're, they're doing more writing without me. <laughs> and I wasn't really pleased with that, of course. Of course. As you can imagine. And then... Um, uh, it got to a, it, things were starting to get to a head. Yeah, I was reading on, on your Wikipedia where it says, I, I think that's what you're getting ready to say, there's a point where um, this management deal kind of, this uh, person's trying to manage the band, and like you're saying, the other members of the band are not liking it, and it got to a point where the other members of the band were trying to kick you out of your own band. <laughs> well, that's where I'm getting to. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, we were playing at, at uh, I think it was called the La Vida Hot Springs. <laughs> And uh, somewhere in Orange County, and Art, you know, and, and all his inimitability, and 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 you really have to. This this goes classifies into the what were you thinking category. Yeah, yeah. But it, we had a there was a break, and he's walking around the club to actually telling people we're gonna we're planning on kicking Rick out of the band and we're gonna steal the name. Wow, wow. As that, you can imagine, that takes some balls. Got right, right back to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the same the same night. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, I had already 
service mark the name. Trademark, service mark the Smart name. part on your, yeah, trademark, yeah. Yeah, and, and when they found that out, they were furious. Well, that, that just know. goes to show who has the brains, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, this kind of also shows you, yeah. there was a band who didn't even want to use the name Sin. Yeah. Now they're, they're getting to the point where they don't want to give it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's all of a sudden, six months down the road, we're, we're cocks of the walk, we've got our thumbs in our suspenders, look how big we are. You know, it's not all about Rick Fox anymore. It's it's, it's uh, not that it ever was. No, yeah. But uh, you know, I, you know, like you said, the first, I think the couple of shows we had booked, it was you know, early on. It was Sin with Rick Rick Fox from Steeler. Yeah. I mean, that's that's just a business move. It's a yeah. good business move. Yeah, and, and let me ask you, Rick. So from the time you got these guys in the band, um, what was the point? Like, how, how far was it when you guys first started? Like, okay, let's let's get into writing tunes now. <laughs> Well, I mean, we were we were writing as soon as as soon as the five of us were together in a room. And and so so you mentioned this real important part of the story that I want to get here. Uh, we we touched on this uh, slightly in part one and some of our past interviews. But you mentioned the song "On the Run." That's the one that you released as a big picture disc. Um, and that's a song that um, you've shared this with me and other people over the years about. Um, that's a song that later would go on um, to become known as um, "Let Freedom Rock," where um, Vinnie Vincent and Dana Strum kind of. Um, they, they stole your song and they, they renamed it and so why don't we get into that now and let people know a little bit more about that story all right well that, that, what we have to do is we have to show the transition okay go ahead before we, before we get to that yeah so anyway uh, we get into the studio to, to record what would be our first album okay yeah. and and Bill Matoyer, a great engineer Bill Bill is, is you know engineering this and it, it just you know, the, 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 the stupidity got to a point where it was like Spinal Tap ridiculous before there was Spinal Tap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we got into this ridiculous fight in the studio, and it was accusations, name-calling. Uh, the egos were absolutely, the boil was about to pop. The <laughs> egos were out of control in the band. Yeah. And uh, I said, watch this. And I packed to put my bass in my case. I turned around, and I walked out. I said, that's it. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I went out. I walked out. I said, to, "I apologize to Bill." I said, "I'm I'm really sorry for this. Uh, you can hear what's going on in there." I said, "You know, it's not like you, you can't hear it." Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I apologize to you, Bill. I've never done this before, but you know, uh, all due respect, I, I I can't stay here and do this with these guys. And I walked out. You know that 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 was a leap of faith right there. Yeah, yeah. That's taking. So they try to continue on without me, and it was that led to a huge fight in the press back and forth every week in, in the magazines and the letter sections on this battle, this fight over the name. Wow. And this, this yeah. um, I dare say, this, I mean, we got, we got to let people, I mean, this is a co common thing these days. I mean, L.A. Guns and Rat and the Two Great Whites, the Two Queens, right? These, um, especially like Rat, I mean, they finally got ownership of a name where it belongs, but um, L.A. Guns, they finally kind of settled, but these are bands been fighting over their names for years, but, but um, you, you predate we, all yeah, that. Yeah, we, we kind of laid the foundation for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I had a I had a show proof to all of the, 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 uh, the not only the clubs and the, and the booking agents, uh -huh. but I had to contact all the newspapers that there were, that were, you know, that have a, a, a column ad that shows what bands are upcoming. Yeah. I said, look, here's my proof. I own the name. You cannot book them as sin. And then they, they try to go around me <laughs> and use periods, yeah. S period, I period, N period. Well, what they didn't know was that was the name of Motley Crue's fan club, Strength in Numbers. Oh. <laughs> yeah. wow. So I called up Nikki Six. I said, Nikki, this is what's going on. And I explained it to him. I said, now they're calling themselves S period, I period, N period. That's your fan club. He goes, he goes I'll take it from here. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> wow. So, he contacts his attorneys, and they contact them and said, no, you can't call it S period, I period, N period. So now they're getting backed into a corner, <laughs> and I got introduced to uh, uh, Ronnie Dio's attorney, Stan Diamond. Oh, wow. Over in West L.A. He was, you know, for Sabbath and Dio yeah, and all yeah. that. And I, I went in, I had a, a meeting, I explained to him what's going on, I showed him all the evidence, and he, he hits them with a couple of cease and desist letters. And at this point, they're like, you know what, this is just... This is not worth all the trouble. Let's just get rid of it. And and they, they dropped it. I won. Wow. <laughs> and they, they changed their name to Jaguar. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, and that's like that. Now, 
uh, just the jumping back and forth here. I'm, I'm now talking again with Vince Gilbert. I just assisted in the re-release of the Jaguar album, and I wrote a, a whole series of liner notes for for uh, for that album. Now release. that's kind of come M- full circle. That's pretty cool. Um, talk about that. I mean, I, I'm pretty interested in how you kind of uh, made up after all that. Uh, well, it's just it was over the years. You yeah, know, yeah. I didn't want to have anything to do with the guys. Yeah, yeah. They, they were had all kinds of stupid accusations about what happened with the band. I kept meticulous notes over the years. And, and here we are, you know, it was at, uh, a couple of NAMM shows ago, Vince was walking around, and somebody ambushed me and, and said, hey, let's get a picture of you guys together. And we're like, oh, uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. like that. And that's kind of how it led off to us eventually starting to talk again. And Vince is like, you know, that was so long ago. It's, it's all water under the bridge. I really don't remember half of what happened, yeah. you know, like that. And we just started talking, and he contacted me one day, and he said, we're going to be re-releasing Jack, the Jaguar album, you know, and, and On The Run is going to be on it, your song, like that. Oh, wow. And, and uh, you know, is there anything you'd like to, to, to do or, or help with that or whatever? And I said, do you want me to write some liner notes? He says, yeah, that'd be great. Uh-huh. Because I don't remember everything. So if you could write some liner notes, that would be great. Yeah. So I got, I got introduced to, to Steve over at FNA Records. And I, I just, you know, uh, I wrote a whole shitload of liner notes wow. and all, ki- all kinds of stuff to help him with that. I gave him tons of pictures. You know, I said, I said, put it this way. The story of Jaguar cannot be told without the story of sin, which is where Jaguar came from. Wow, yeah, because actually just off the ashes of sin. And, and it's kind of, um, I got to tell people, because uh, anybody who follows Rick Fox on fa- Facebook, um, and, and you even in um, doing the Rick Fox story here, you've sent me um, some some of your private photos from your collection just to kind of see. And I, I tell you, you're really, you, um, I got to commend you, Rick. You're really great at, um, like, I don't know what you want to call it, like archiving stuff, but um, you got all these great photos from your private collection that you put up out there for people to see. And it's great stuff. I, I thank you. I, I, I have to have documentation and proof because I get so many people, you know, over the years trying to look for a, some way to, to, to attack me and my credibility or you know, uh, integrity, and I, I go, yeah, well, here's the proof, and then I shuts them down when I got a picture of what I'm talking about, so, uh, that, that, it, I, there's so much I can't remember that I wish I could, Yeah, I mean, the, the, the pictures help. I mean, know? that goes back to kind of like what you're saying, um, when you're talking about your Wasp days before, where Blackie, Blackie, Lawless, and some of his, um, cohorts try to, um, make the claim that you were never, ever in Wasp, and, like, like we've seen those pictures you've posted, you know, on, on Facebook and stuff. And I, and I seen even recently you were posting some of those demos that you did with the band back in the day. So it, it's, it's and not that you needed to do that, but it, it's amazing that you kind of had the tenacity to just kind of know to do that. Just, just maybe just to archive what you did, you know? Yeah. Those, those pictures <laughs> and the demo is, is a bane to Blackie. Sixes. I mean, it's, it's worth a thousand words, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so, so I walk out of out of Jaguar. They continue with another bass player to, to do their album, and out of the blue, I get a phone call from a guitar player that I played with when we were living together back in Jersey, and I was trying to put another lineup of sin together back there. Okay. And it turns out he was in a band, in a Long Island band called Alien. Alien. Okay. And Alien had put out an EP with five songs. And they were they were they were uh, like on the level of sin, but but like in Long Island, you okay. know, they, were, they, were, they had a self-contained you know, PA lights, all the effects. They had a great crew working for them, and they were they were playing you know big gigs, and and they had a huge following. So this guitar player, his name, well, his real name's Joe Maffey, but uh, uh, he called when I was with him, he called himself JJ. Okay. Okay, J- J- JJ Christie, because uh, we both dated this this one girl, and her last name was Amy Christie, so he, he used her name as, as his last name. Oh, wow, that's cool. And then, but the thing is, when he was an alien, he had he had split from Staten Island in Jersey, moved out to Long Island. The guy was always on the move, and he changed his name t- to Rick Christie. <laughs> wow, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Spelling it like mine, R-I-K, and, and Rick Christie. So that's how people knew him. And then when I'd say JJ, they go, who's that? I said, JJ and Rick Christie are the same person. I'd explain it to them. They go, oh, okay. That explains a lot. Anyway, JJ calls me up. I don't know how he got my number. I really don't remember. Okay. And and uh, 
And he says, listen, I, I heard that uh, Kiss is auditioning guitar players. Is it possible that you could, like, get me a get me an audition? Did you know those guys? And I'm like, wait a minute. You called me up to ask me to get, get you an audition with Kiss. You owe me, there's a small, this is a small outstanding issue here. You owe me, you owing me $400 for a phone bill you stuck me with. Oh. When you, we, were, we were roommates and you moved out. Okay, yeah. Uh, and he was kind of embarrassed about that. See, I remember that stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and like that, and, and and it was hemming and hawing and like that. And he said, "Well, listen, Alien just broke up." I said, "That's funny because Sin out here just broke up, kind of, sort of." Yeah. I explained what happened, <laughs> and I said, "Why don't you come out to L.A. and bring your guys, and we'll form a new new lineup of Sin?" He goes, "I can do that. I can do that." And, and I, I wanted one guitar. I said, "You know, I." I that's, for all his foibles and, and problems and, and issues, JJ was a great guitar player. Wow. wow! And he could he could whatever I couldn't exp- I didn't know technically I could explain to him verbally, and he could put it out on the guitar. How that cool. was that was perfect for me. Wow! Wow! You know, and he says, "Well, I got another mm-hmm. guitar player," and I said, "I really don't want to have two guitars." He goes, "No, he's really good. He's really good. Plus, he's got the van." Mm-hmm. I went, "Oh, yeah. okay." Okay. Yeah. They said, "All right." So he brought he brought the his other guitar player Richie and the singer Frank Starr with him. Yeah, yeah, wow. And they drove across the country. They had their own adventures, I can tell you. But they drove across the country. They showed up where I was living in Venice, and we put the new lineup of Sin together. We immediately sat down and started working on songs. Okay. The thing is, we didn't really have enough songs to do a whole set, so I suggested, in my openness. Why don't we pad the set list with some Alien songs? This way, the California people get who may have heard of you will get to see Alien songs until so we can write more new material. Wow, wow. So that's that's kind of what we did, and, and we beefed up the Alien songs. They were even heavier. Than before. Than, and yeah. the, the Sin versions, you know, of, of the Alien songs, like that. And then and we already got the Troubadour wanted to book us, and we didn't even have a drummer yet. Wow, amazing, amazing. I mean, things happen for a reason, Rick. And, you know, um, we should mention the singer Frank Starr. Um, he was, of course, would go on to be the front man for the um, Four Horsemen. So um, right. a lot of talent in this band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and Frank was a tough guy from day one. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was he was uh, sleeping in the van while me and Rishi and Jay were working on stuff. <laughs> and, and Jay went out to wake him up. And that's something you just don't do. I find don't wake up Frank when he's sleeping. <laughs> and the two of them started getting getting into a into a knockdown drag out fight in the street. Wow, wow. And I got in the middle of it and I broke them up. You know, and and uh, like that. And and we broke you know, Frank, come on, you gotta be in here in the writing process. Yeah, so yeah. like that. <clears throat> it turns out this there was a song they were doing in Alien that Jay had stolen from me and, and given it another title. <laughs> wow, wow. I had a song called I'm No Angel. And they had re, re, reworded it as time after time. Now, now here's the and, thing. Here's the thing I want to know. Did, did he honestly kind of um, forget that and think oh, it's a different song because we changed the title or whatever? Or, or, or um, do you think he remembered? Well, what happened was I started showing the Mom No Angel. Uh, yeah. Which I wrote, I wrote in uh, 1978, 79. Wow. And I had to, or of course, you know, showed it to Jay when we were together. But... When I started playing I'm No Angel, the other guitar player, Richie, goes, hey, that sounds like time after time. And when he said that, Jay kind of hit him under the table and went, shh, like that. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Show me time after time. And Richie started playing it. I said, "That's." I looked over at Jay, and he just, it was like, it, it was, he was busted. It was nothing yeah. he could get out of with yeah. that. You know? Yeah, your own bandmates. And, and, and Frank and Richie were like, oh, so you stole Rick's song brought it into Alien, and now we're doing it as time after time. So that kind of put everybody on alert about Jay. Wow, wow. Hey, within the old band, your old band, yeah. I, guess. Well, I said, no, it's originally called I'm No Angel, and I showed it to him, and we, that was in the set. Oh, wow, wow. And, and, and that was another big song that the fans liked. Anyway, so we get booked to do a show. We don't have a drummer yet. And uh, I remember one of the bands that opened with uh, for us was called uh, Prisoner. And the drummer, this guy was like like Jose Paul. Okay, yeah. And and Frankie, not Frankie Minnelli, uh, uh, Fra- um What the hell's his name? Uh, uh, Bobby Rondinelli. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Then he actually had a part in his drum break, 
this drum solo that he stole from Bobby Rondinelli from the Straight Between the Eyes tour. Wow. Wow, wow. Yeah. And, and, I, and I yelled out, what are you, Bobby Rondinelli? So he was busted. He knew somebody knew what he was doing. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and, you know, and he was a Latino. Wow, amazing. He was a Mexican guy. Yeah. You know, long black curly hair. You know, was, he had the look. Yeah. Uh, we, we had kind of met um, we, there was a, a we were extras in, 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 in doing like a lot of you know uh, extra work in films yeah yeah and there was a, a, a science fiction film that we were all the bands in Hollywood were in uh, and and we kind of hung out together on a, on a set on the set and, and he said hey if you ever need a drummer let me know wow and I said well you remember that that pitch he goes yeah I said I got con- contact with him I said uh, uh, why don't you try out for us I said get me a picture and a tape and, and, and we'll see what happens. And, you know, it's like the same thing I did with, with Ron Keel did with me. Wow. Give me a tape, let's see what happens. Um, and, and he did. He got right on it. Got a picture and a, and a, a tape in, in a couple of days. And we went out to his... Uh, his uh, he, he practiced in his, his parents' garage. Out in, in like... Um, oh, I want to say... Uh, I can't remember the town. Uh... Monterey Park. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Around that area. And so, uh, there was a huge restaurant, a golf course called the Quiet Cannon. He lived like up the street from there. So anyway, so we show up, we bring our gear, and we just start jamming. And we all look at each other and go, this is the guy. <laughs> he's, he's, this is going to work. I enjoy playing with him. As, as a bass player, yeah. it, you know, for the rhythm section... I really enjoyed playing with this guy. He could, I could throw ideas at him, and, and he'd match me. Wow, wow. You know, so so this this was this is somebody I wanted to play with. Uh, anyway, so so we rehearsed really fast, really hard, and and we got ready and we did our first show at the Troubadour. We headlined. It was like a, you know a bitch witch thing again. You know, well, who do you well. want open? Who do you want close? Yeah, like that. And and the, the, they started booking us as Rick Fox's sin. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. And, and that's where that came from. Yeah. I said, look, why don't you call the other band Vince Gilbert's sin? Well, nobody knows who Vince Gilbert is. Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You see? Yeah, yeah. So, we were going to joke around and call it, it for like, we're going to do five bookings and call it Sin with Frank Starr, Sin with J.J. Christie, Sin with, you know, like like that, with, with the other band members' names. Okay, oh, wow. That, what a unique you know, idea. just as kind of an inside joke. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But uh, the band took off bigger, harder, faster, wilder than the first Sin lineup. Wow, wow. We were like the L.A. version of Twisted Sister because you had four-fifths of the band were New Yorkers. Okay, yeah. That was something that the California bands didn't understand. They could not, they could, it's, it's uh, what is, what's the saying? Often imitated but never duplicated. Yeah, yeah, and you got the unique um, privilege of, kind of being an originally uh, uh, New York guy that was on the New York scene for many years and then you move out to the West Coast and so you've actually had experience both in the New York scene and the L.A. scene. Right. Yeah. So I had like you know, except for the drummer, the four of us up front were all New Yorkers, and Frank had the you know the the the, uh, the New York attitude, and you know don't fuck with him, he's from New York, you know like that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. New York accent, you know. And I I had improved the costumes, and each guy had you know a shredded costume with his own color, like that. You know I had red, yeah. and, and uh, JJ had white, Richie had blue, Mark had like lavender. Frank wore like a conglomerate of whatever he wanted to wear. I said, look, you're the front guy. Just do your town. Do, yeah. do whatever you want out front. Yeah, yeah. You like that. And that's what we did. And and Frank was, was he was the media darling. Everybody loved Frank. He was a great front man. Uh, he, he, he had some rough edges that needed to be polished. Yeah. Uh, sometimes he didn't know the, always the right thing to say. But he always managed to recover really quick, really good. And, and it, it, it was like... We were so transparent. We were like a, it was said that we were like a people's band. That's why they loved us. And now here's a question for you, Rick. Because again, uh, this all predates. Um, there was no internet back um, when Sin was on the scene. And so here's my question for you. I, I know a lot of bands back in the day. Um, you know, um, you'd have to go and you you you'd pump out those flyers all over the, you know, all over the place. Um, what was that like for you guys? We were like a lot of the bands with the flyers. We plaster them everywhere we could. And do you have any of those still, like the, you know, that you save again, just art kind of archive? Yeah, yeah uh, I've, got, I've got some in a suitcase. That's cool. Yeah, you got that stuff and, even. And, and we started to, we started to, we 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 were we were kind of at the top of the first lineup. This band went over the top. Yeah. 
and uh, we were headlining everywhere. And we did the uh, the downtown LA street scene, which was you know a series of outdoor events and shows, and uh, all the you know the, the hot LA bands got on this, and uh, and uh, we we headlined there. And it was the first time we played in front of a crowd. It was like at least five thousand, at least. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was like the entire street from building side to building side a, a full city block back oh wow you know and and we went on and man we just killed it we killed it they had the, the whole well the stage the, the whole stage itself must have been about seven feet tall seven to eight feet tall so we're way up you can see us yeah yeah and uh and we we took we took the um they have these little side bleachers for people to sit on for guests on the side of the stage uh-huh and I, I, I said, you know what? We can't have our drummer on the floor. Okay, yeah. And I put these risers together with these steps up like that, and we put that for the drum risers so we could walk, run up and down to the drums like that. No, no other, none of the other bands had done that. And then, uh, so, and in the front of, down on the street, in front of the stage, they had those, those metal 55 gallon drums. Oh, oh yeah. Up, and they were all full of water. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like like a barrier, so so people couldn't get to the stage, you know, like a neutral zone, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the, the people were rocking those barrels back and forth, and the water was splashing up out of the top. Oh it was wow, intense. Wow. I bet. Now now so, you mentioned no one. Who, show, who yeah. shows up? <laughs> who yeah. shows up to try and cause trouble? <laughs> okay. Art Darish, the singer from the first sin. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> And he's trying to provoke people to start a riot, and throw stuff at us. Wow! Somebody threw a can of but an unopened can of Budweiser beer up onto the stage, and they hit one of the girls that was sitting on the side. Of us. They hit her in the head and knocked her out. Oh wow! A second one came flying up, and Frank caught it in midair, opened it, and drank it. And the crowd went nuts. They loved it. Wow! That that's thinking on your so, feet. Yeah. So, so, um, so, um, let me think. So Art's trying to sneak around through the backstage area and, and, and go through the, through our dressing room area. Wow. And, and we, after our show and we caught him and, and I, I didn't do anything, but yeah. some of the, some of the people were trying to like hold him down and, and, and beat him up or something. Oh, and, wow. And a cop shows up on horseback on what's the commotion? <laughs> we said the guy's trying to break into our, our dressing room here, and and, and I don't, we don't know what he's doing. He's stealing stuff. The cops took him away, and they handcuffed him, and they took him away. Oh wow! <laughs> what a yeah, story! But, yeah, that, that's what you guys is the karma. Yeah, and that, now, um, of course you were friends with Nikki and known him from before, and you and this is by the time sin hits, Molly's already kind of making some real serious noise. Now my question: um, How well did you know like the guys in Rat and that? <clears throat> I, I knew the I auditioned for Rat. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, I never knew that. After, after I was at a Wasp, uh, the Rat was one of the bands I auditioned for uh, in Stephen Piercy's uh, grandmother's garage in Culver City. Oh, wow. Okay. And I, and I still have the tape they gave me to learn the songs. Oh, wow, wow. And so that's and, after they changed the name from Mickey Rat to Rat. Uh, yeah, they was just Rat. They weren't Mickey Rat yet. Uh, oh. That was they, they were they were out of San Diego for a while now. Yeah, they, yeah. Oh, wow. That's this was cool. Be, this was before Juan Carusier, of course. But Blotzer, yeah. Bobby Blotzer was in the band. Yeah. What was he like? Because um, I don't think he's too a, much of him. But he's a real, he's yeah. a real smart ass. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Five guy. Yeah. Like that. He didn't he didn't want me in the band because I didn't I didn't play bass with my fingers at that time. I was I played with a pick. Wow. <laughs> and and he was very adamant about. I have to have a bass player who plays with his fingers, man. Because that I want to feel it. I want to feel it like that. And I said, just, just who uses? Nobody uses a pick. Yeah. And I said, like what? Gene Simmons, Paul McCartney, yeah. Tom Hamilton. I started rolling off all these bass players that use picks. Yeah. You know, and, and he didn't like that. Well, I just tell you, you know, car, like you said, karma's a bitch. It comes back to people. But um, the the funny thing I was reading about, you know, rat fighting over the name, um, Juan Crozier, who had been out of the band for like twenty years. If Bobby Blotcher had not gone to try to sue him over the name, um, they may never have found out that the original um, RAD agreement was kind of still um, the official agreement, and Juan Crozier might not have ended up with part of a name <laughs> if Bob had never sued him, you know? Yeah, well, I don't know what to say on that. Yeah, yeah, but getting back to, I mean, what a great story. I mean, uh, so, talking so anyway, about this. So anyway, so we just finished our show. Yeah. And Striper goes to go on behind her after us. Wow! Wow! Striper. And they, they were looking through the through the amp line. 
yeah. at the people, and and they were scared. They were like, "Oh my God, we never played in front of anybody like this many people." You know. Yeah. And, and, and Let me ask you, Rick. At that time, like, were they throwing Bibles out like to the crowd and that? I, I we didn't stick around to see. Oh, okay. But, okay. but that's not the only time we played with Striper. We we did a co-headline at the Pomona Auditorium. Wow. Pomona Valley Auditorium, PVA, with with Striper, and uh, and they were had they had one dressing room in the basement on one side, and we were in on the other side, and they were afraid of us. Amazing. I mean, look, at, look at Sin and Striper together. I mean, that's a show. Yeah, yeah, I would think so. And they, they didn't know who, what we were about, you know. Yeah, I, and, and uh, uh, the pipes in the in their their dressing room broke, and their their dressing room flooded. Wow. And we said, "Hey, come on over. We'll share our dressing room with you." Yeah. And and they kind of like were real hesitant. They were kind of you know nervous and and thought we were. They didn't know what we were about because you know with the name Sin, they were that's they were against that. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but when they saw we were just regular guys, it's no big deal, and and. And we, we became friends, really good friends, you know, and we shared our dressing room with them. And then uh, we did a great show, and then they went on. And then uh, uh, I was standing in the wings, and Michael Sweet looks over and goes, told them the story about what happened and how we were kind enough and generous to share our dressing room with them. And they, we, you know, calls me up on stage, and everybody starts booing. All the Striper fans start booing. Wow. Well, and he goes, hey, 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 wait a minute now, don't do that. I just said this guy is a friend of ours. Yeah. And, you know, maybe someday he'll find Jesus the way we have. <laughs> wow. you know, like that. Yeah. And, and, and But, you know, he, we're still, and he, you know, put his arm around me and like that. And then and everybody started cheering. Wow. You know, and, well, and they, I still have one of the little Bibles I used to throw out with the striper sticker on it. That, that's cool. Now, now um, I got to ask you, like, um, <laughs> as you're coming up, like, you know, and, and Sin is kind of just starting to make some serious noise. Um, when you'd see a band like Striper went, went on to kind of have the success they did, what, what's that like for you to say, oh, you know, I, I, I started out with those guys? <laughs> well, you know, good for them. You know, they, yeah, they yeah. walked into a better deal than we did. Yeah, yeah. You know, they didn't have people trying to screw them around, I guess. I, I guess I guess the point I'm trying to make, it, it must also give you the feeling that, like, um, when you have people trying to even, um, you know, doubt that the fact that you were ever in a band like Wasp or something like that, it kind of gives you a little bit of validity to say, well, you know, I, I must have had some kind of talent to make it to that level that, you know, these guys like in Striper made. You know, I was playing the same scene with them. I did shows with them. It's got to um, give you a feeling of a little bit of validity, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, before there was Striper, there was there were Rock's Regime. Yeah, yellow yeah, yeah. Black, yellow and Black Attack. They were wearing yellow and black stripes before there was Striper. And I, I heard um, before Oz Fox was ever in the band that um, CeCe DeVille was the guitar player shortly. When they were still calling themselves Rock's regime, uh, I don't know about that. Oh, okay. I, I, when I saw them, he wasn't in the band. They had a different guy. Might have been. But, one of those. But, uh, yeah, but then Striper was a self-contained unit. I mean, they had their parents, their uncles, their aunts. Yeah, you know, who family. Was screw with them. You yeah, know? yeah. They had a good support system. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. So you know, and everybody's always looking to find the one moment where they can find an embarrassing, controversial thing about them to catch them going, "Aha! See, they're not really what they are." Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've you know. heard Michael Sweet talk about that over years. He said, you know, we're like anybody. We we, we have our beliefs, but we, we fall every now and then. And um, in fact, they said that's why he um, broke Striper up for, you know, he left Striper and they put it on hold for, for a while. Because he's like, I, I didn't think we were living up to, you know, things the way we should. And so I wasn't really feeling it for a while. <laughs> Well, you know, one thing led to another, yeah. and uh, we were we were doing a. There was a whole backlash against the Olympics in in eighty four, and uh, there was a show put on at the Stardust Ballroom in Hollywood, which was billed as the Metal No Olympics. Oh, okay. <laughs> instead, instead of Old Olympics, yeah. and we had Tariff, and we had Witch, and uh, I forget who the other band was. There was it was it was pretty good billing, and we were headlining. And a gal named Lucy Forbes came to the show. Now, Lucy was well known on the scene for being one of the promoters for the country club. Oh, okay. You know, we had played the country club. Sin played the country club, sold out. Uh, we, I think we, we played with Hostage at London. Uh, it was a bunch of bands. And, and we, we headlined and, and we sold out. So we had a really, Sin was, was, you know, we had, I like to say, Sin had the same kind of buzz about them that Guns N' Roses did when Guns first came out. Okay. Yeah. We had that kind of buzz. You know, we're we're moving up. We're moving up fast, and and like that. So we we played um, the Waters Club on, on uh, December twenty eighth, which is my birthday, nineteen eighty four, which was our last show. Uh, we we sold out the Waters Club, like that. But uh, 
anytime I had an opportunity to do this, um, and I got a Steeler royalty, I took us in the studio just for posterity, and we would record our whole set straight through. Oh, wow. Just straight, and I still have the tapes, which I'd like, like to release at some point. Uh, you know, it's it's the Sin version doing the Alien songs plus the Sin songs. Wow, wow, that's cool. That's part of my, part of my catalog. Um, like that. And uh, it just needs to be tweaked, because, yeah. you know, we, we didn't really have time to to beef up the bass or it was just plug in the board and record and go like that and then uh we would there were times that we would rehearse at sir you know right before a show we'd rehearse at mark's garage and then right before the show i take us and i pay for it and i take us into sir and we'd rehearse in like one of the big rooms just to get the feel of, of a bigger stage and lo and behold we walk in as motley crew you know and and they we we, we rented the same room they rented oh wow <laughs> okay and uh Nicky would, Nicky would say, to, again, in his generosity, Nicky would say, hey, look, you know, we got the room for all day, uh, and it's like dinner time, we're done, just take up, take the rest of our time. Oh, wow, how cool is so that? He would, yeah. he would give us their leftover rehearsal time, so we wouldn't have to pay extra. Yeah. And then they'd stick around him and Mick and Vince, and, they'd, they'd, and Tommy, and they'd watch, and watch us rehearse, so they were kind of, you know, so we had that kind of camaraderie with them as well, you know. Then Nicky said, hey, your, your band sounds great, you guys are really good. Wow, wow. With that, so... Uh, and then Sin had done, we had did, a, did another show, the same promoter that did put us in, uh, with Striper, put us in San Bernardino at the Orange Pavilion, which was a huge venue. There's like national touring acts go through there. Okay. You know, I saw, uh, um, who did I see there? Uh, Iron Maiden played there, uh, you know, a lot of big bands. And, and we were on a bill with Keel. Keel headlined. Wow. We were direct support, and No Sugar opened. No Sugar was a local, well, well-known San Bernardino area uh, local band. Now, well, you, well, now, well, you guys are a different band at this time. What was it like to kind of be in the same bill as your ex-bandmate Ron Keel? Uh, that, that's an interesting question. Yeah, uh, I, I really don't. Ron and I weren't talking very much at that point, and oh. I don't know why. Oh wow, interesting. But he was real busy with Keel. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that, and. Uh, and and uh, it was a little bit of competitiveness. It was L.A., you know, like that. But I guess what I'm asking, like, um, during that show, like, um, was there any communication between you and Ron either before or after the show? Not that much that I can remember, no. Oh, wow, okay. No, my, my, my band members, they were like kids. they just go out and like, talk to everybody. Yeah, yeah. they talk, talk to the other bands, talk to this, talk to that. So they, they, were, they would hobnob and, and rub shoulders with everybody. So that, that's, they were really, they were, people liked them. Yeah. And that was good. That's good. Good promo for us. Good publicity, like that. So um, we go to do the show, and it was just, just, for the most part, it was a success. You know, the crowd it was the place was packed. You know, the Inland, Inland Empire. Uh, everybody came to see us. Us and Keel. You know, yeah. and, and no sugar. You know, to be to be yeah, fair with yeah. them. Uh, and then we came on to do an encore, and right in the middle of the encore, the stage went black. Oh wow. Fade to black. <laughs> somebody, somebody pulled a plug on our encore. Wow! And, and we were pissed. The audience was boo. You know, they didn't like it either because yeah, everybody was all into it. You know, and and then somebody. So I don't know who was responsible for that. Oh wow! Uh, I I really don't know. So I'm not going to cast any aspersions. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Yeah. So, but I was so pissed that uh, you know I I I, uh, I hit the dressing room. And I, I, the dressing rooms were a series of, of trailers, you know, and, and I, uh, I destroyed the bathroom. Wow. I, I slammed the door so hard it went through the door jam the opposite direction. Wow. Uh, and, and it just, I was just furious. I was storming back and forth, back and forth. In a, and and uh, Frank said the wrong thing, <laughs> you know, mocking me. Yeah. And, and Frank and I got into it for, in our first full on brawl wow wow and this brawl was so intense that the security guards were even afraid to come into the trailer to break it up wow <laughs> i mean this was intense yeah now now in the dressing room they have these these barrels full of ice for all your drinks yeah you know keep your, your cans and bottles cold things like that now um, i tackle frank frank picks me up he's got now try to picture this he's standing I'm completely upside down. He's got me, his arms wrapped around my legs, and he's trying to bounce my head on the floor. Wow. Now, I've got my arms wrapped around his legs, and he can't bounce me. 
Amazing. So, so yeah. It's like a standoff. He can't do it, and he can't. Now, while I'm holding on to his legs, and he's trying to bounce me into the floor, I grab into the I handfuls of ice out of this container. Wow. And I'm Charlie horsing him in the legs with the handfuls of ice. Okay. Okay. Now the ice is melting on the floor. It's a, it's an oh, it's a sea of, of water. And and we just kind of stop for a second. We look around, and there's like a crowd of people looking in the doorway, watching the fight go on. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> like I'm totally afraid to come in. Yeah, this, yeah. I mean, this was loud. And I look at Frank, and Frank looks at me. And we look at the floor with all the, all the water and the ice, and we bust it up laughing. It just turned from, from fight into, into, like, this is really funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. And, and I get up, and he picks me up, and we kind of hug like that. And we, we go and confront the promoter. Yeah, that's what was pissing me off, is the promoter, there was nothing in the contract about them trying to get a piece of our merchandise booth. Oh, Wow. He tried to help himself to some of the, uh, the our profits from the merchandise booth, from the sin shirts, you know, or from our merchandise. Yeah. And, and they, he had no right to that. That was not discussed. It was not in the contract. He was helping himself. So that also led to me, like, being pissed off because I had to be called over to the merch booth with this and, and like that and confront him. And it was just yelling this back and forth. Yelling through. Anyway, the funny thing is, Aerosmith played the Orange Pavilion the following weekend. Yeah. And Steven Tyler was had the same dressing room. He was complaining that the doors wouldn't close and the, and the bathrooms, the toilet wouldn't work. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I wrote the whole dressing room. Yeah. I completely destroyed the whole trailer. Oh, how, how, how rock and roll. funny. Yeah, and yeah. Anyway, so let me get back to the Stardust Ballroom. Lucy Forbes shows up with this guy named Todd Cooper. Todd worked, or I don't know, worked, but Todd was Todd had an office at Management Three in, in Beverly Hills. Okay. Management Three is Jerry Weintraub's company. Jerry Weintraub was one of the biggest, most powerful people in the Hollywood entertainment industry. All right, they managed the Eagles, John Denver. Okay, okay, uh, wow. Uh, you know that that that, that Cal, you know, he put out movies like Karate Kid. You know. Uh, uh, Jerry was a mover and shaker. He was huge. Apparently so, yeah. 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 Uh, Neil Diamond, uh, I can't remember all the bands. Oh, he he's all over the place. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, these are all bands under their roster. All signed bands, proven acts. We yeah. were unproven. We were unsigned. So, Todd says, there's a lot of buzz going on about you. I'd like to be involved. I say, well, what can you do? And he tell, told me what Management 3 was. He says, we'd like to put you in the studio. And, and uh, get you signed and put you out on the road. I said, okay, sounds good. At least on paper. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're like that. And um, so we also had the liberty and the luxury of Management 3's entire office as far as mailing. You know, we, we, we had huge, made a huge mailing fan base. So we had access to all of the stationery, the copy machines. Um, I was doing a lot of stuff, paste up stuff by hand. Wow, and we wow. were there for for hours running off flyers, hundreds and thousands of flyers on their tab, you know, and we yeah, didn't get yeah. charged for that. How oh, cool. And then, and then they, they, uh, they, we got some spec time at uh, Kendon Studios in Burbank, uh, which is where Stevie Wonder and Paul McCartney would record when they were in town. Okay. This is like big time studio. And uh, so we're, we're rehearsing at Mark's Garage, and Todd has Dana Strum show up. <laughs> okay. Dana, at that point, wasn't in Vinnie Vincent yet. He was, he was with Danny Spanos. Danny Spanos had one hit on the radio, real big hit, and then he disappeared. Okay. <laughs> Danny was very unstable. He lived in a shack somewhere in a desert. It was really hard to get, you know, get in touch with him for gigs and business, stuff like that. Anyway, Dana was something of a mover and shaker. As we know, he put Randy Rhodes and Jakey Lee in Ozzy Osbourne's band. Yeah, that's his claim to fame. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, I, I met Dana a few years be or a year before that. He was playing in, in some uh, new wave punk band. And I wasn't impressed. But yeah. anyway, um, Dana has no... no um, bodily rhythm when he's playing. <laughs> he's, like, he's like a puppet with a few strings missing. <laughs> and anybody, anybody that's seen him play knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, he comes to the rehearsal 
And he says, well, we're going to come check you out, okay? And we're, we're going to put you in the studio, blah, blah, blah. And he watches us go through the set. And then he pulls me on the side and says, listen, I can get you guys assigned. You got, definitely got something going on here. However, you're going to have to get rid of the drummer and you're going to have to get rid of that singer. <laughs> because your drummer's beater's all over the place. And your singer is straining. The stuff you're doing is out of his range. <laughs> Now, you know, it's like it's like the deal with the devil. You want to go move on? You yeah. got to do this. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, you know, otherwise, we'll just walk away and call it a day. You know. Now, I, I, I have my druthers on on, on, on this. I uh, I regret what I did. Yeah. But it fell upon me to to say, listen, you know, we want to go somewhere, but Mark, they, they they said you're you're there's a problem with your playing. I don't I don't see it. Yeah. I don't I don't feel it. Uh, but they're saying that. If we're going to get signed, we can't do it with you. Oh, wow, wow. And and, and he, I felt, I'm telling you, man, I felt like shit. I felt terrible having to be the guy to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can so, imagine. And to this day, you know, it's it's been a sore spot with Mark. He's playing with Graham Bonnet now. Well, I think he did all right. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah. congratulations for him. But yeah. anytime I would try to think about re reforming sin, I gave him right a first refusal. And he'd, he'd say, no, nah, thanks. I'll, I think I'll pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I know it still bothers him. And I mean, I mean, come on, Mark, it's years later. I've already apologized. I told you I feel like crap about it. But, yeah, yeah. You know, I had to let him go. And we had to let Frank go. Wow. You know, Frank was a little bit more, you know, he, he took it a little bit better, on the, you know, than on the chin. And mm -hmm. So, hey, man, you know, I know a lot of people, I'll just, I'll find something else. Yeah, well, a good attitude you had to have, I guess. And, and, he, and he did, you know, he yeah. played with Randy Castillo wow. and Bone Angel, and then he, we moved on and he had uh, Four Horsemen. Oh, wow, yeah. You know, we, we got, in, got in with Rick Rubin and he was doing fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, uh, you know, Dana goes to put us in the studio and he brings in a drummer that I, I only met once. It was some kid from Vegas. Okay. The, yeah. kid, the kid drove in from Vegas, set up his drums, tuned them, played four, recorded four songs, tore down his kit, drove back to Vegas all in one night. Wow, wow. So, I mean, that's that's how Dana works. You yeah, know, yeah. And, like that. So, yeah, and, and we, we didn't even do the drums and bass first. We did, like recorded totally against the grain and we did all the guitars and the bass first interesting interesting yeah the way to do like it like that in the middle we started in the middle and worked our way out from there wow uh, like that but, i mean we, we had we had some drum tracks and stuff to work with rhythm stuff but then he brings in mark slaughter yeah, yeah okay yeah to do the to do the, the uh, tracking for the vocals and, and we gotta we gotta let people know at this point in time um this is before Mark Slaughter was ever in the Vinnie Vincent invasion. I mean, um, I, I think it's right around the time they got rid of Robert Fleischman. Right, that's correct. Yeah. So, so um, you know, Dana and Vinnie already knew about Mark. Yeah. There was no, there was no, that story about a, a, a demo tape with no name and yeah. phone number. That yeah. was that was BS. That was in fact, I heard that Dana had originally wanted Mark from the get go, but Vinnie um, wanted Robert. So of course he he got what he wanted. <laughs> Yeah. That could be. I, yeah. I don't know. But, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so Mark comes in and he's doing the tracking, for, for, you know, all, all the, the tracking for the vocals and everything. And I thought, wow, let, this guy could be our singer. <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm going to hold on to him. Yeah, we know why now, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah he's covering his ass. Yeah. So uh, they, we get a guy come in out of San Diego who chased, I was, I was told, chased all the other bands out of San Diego, like Rat and Warrior uh -huh. and everybody, because this guy was that good. Wow. And his name his name was Rick Reed. Okay. Now, at this, at this point, Rick Reed's claim to fame, besides driving a sparklets truck, was, uh, he supposedly, he, there was a Budweiser commercial that sounded like Rainbow in the Dark, but it, it was, you know, this Bud's for you. Yeah. And it sounded like, like you know, Ronnie Dio. Wow. And, and apparently, that was this guy, Rick Reed, I was told, did, did the vocals for that. Wow. So by the time this, the Sin demo tape was done, we did uh, uh, On the Run, Don't Say Goodbye, um, uh, uh, We Got Your Rock. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, and um, okay, Jesus, I can't even think of the fourth song. I got to sit here in the case and I can't remember. So we did a four song demo and it, it 
really created a buzz, more of a buzz. Wow, wow. Like that. You know, the tape was done, um, and, and uh, after after Sin, I had walked into BC Rich with this tape. I, I met with Bernie Rico, senior. I said, we just got out of the studio. I'd like you to hear our tape. And he, in 30 seconds into On the Run, he goes, welcome to BC Rich. What would you like us to make for you? Wow, wow. That's a pretty, that's a pretty um, good introduction. Um, well, the tape sounded that good. Yeah, yeah. It sounded like what it was called. It was called an album master demo. Yeah. So it sounded like yeah. like it was already on an album. Yeah. Hey, Rick, if you could hold, hold on for just a minute, um, something yeah. I want to ask. Um, anyways, Rick, um, hold on a minute.